Jesus, you never give up on us or forget about us or leave us. God, your love is never ending, never breaking. 
Jesus, you are good in the midst of everything. So God, we give you our worship. We give you our attention. I pray, Jesus, that we would leave here a little different. God, we love you. We pray all this in your powerful name. Amen. Church, thanks for singing with us. You can go ahead and take a seat. Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us for Eagle Brook Online. My name is Jeff Dodge, I'm the online campus pastor, and real quick, I wanna shout out our newest viewing group that just started last weekend in Cook, Minnesota. Cook is about three and a half hours away from our nearest campus, and their first meeting had a great turnout. They're meeting in the local theater, so if you live in the area or you're traveling up north, you are invited to stop in. To see if there's a viewing group near you, be sure to check out the map on our website. Also, I'm really excited for next weekend, which is our summer baptism at the lake. It's always the highlight of my summer because we get to meet online attenders face to face, and many of which are traveling over state lines and others even internationally to show up and declare their faith in front of their church. And some who have never even set foot in Minnesota before this. How wild is that? And the reason I'm telling you this is because it's not too late. Baptism is our declaration of faith. It is the first step of obedience that Jesus calls us to. And there's no requirements beyond putting faith in Jesus. So don't feel like you have to get your life in order before you get baptized. In scripture, we see many examples of people putting faith in Jesus and immediately turning around and getting baptized. The symbolism is that we're uniting with Jesus in his death as we're lowered into the water. And as we come out, we're in the same way, uniting with him in his resurrection. It's this beautiful picture of our old ways of life being laid to rest so that we can live in the freedom that Jesus calls us to. And so if you've never taken that step in your faith, or maybe you did it as an infant and you wanna do it for yourself as an adult, we would love to baptize you. And we'll be at the lake for most of the weekend on July 22nd and 23rd. Each campus baptizes at a different time. For us online, it's at 2.30 p.m. on the 23rd. But if that time doesn't work for you, Find another time over the weekend that does. The important thing is that you get baptized. If you're traveling to be here and if it works for your schedule, we would love to have you attend the 11 a.m. service at our Lino Lakes campus. And after that, we're gonna provide lunch for you and the people traveling with you. Then after we're done eating, we'll head out to the lake or you could just meet us at the lake at 2.30. Whatever the case, we are really looking forward to next weekend and we hope to see you there. But with that, I am gonna hand it over to the man that needs no introduction, our former senior pastor, Bob Merritt. But before we get there, check this out. This summer, we're taking a road trip to Eagle Brook's four newest locations. Our last stop is Apple Valley. This location began as a mobile site in Lakeville South High School in 2019, but they were always looking for a permanent space. Menards in Apple Valley was relocating, leaving a large space behind. Our expansion team looked at that old Menards and said, Eagle Brook. Campus pastor Ryan Whittle needed to do some vision casting. Let me understand this. You had a service in this very spot uh, when the building still looked like a Menards. Right. What was that like? Well, we invited all of our volunteers uh, to come to this space and wanted to do a makeshift service of what would be our auditorium. So just imagine. Where we are sitting imagine. right now. Uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, it was a neat experience to be able to cast vision behind why we're doing this right here. And it's inspiring to be able to sit in a seat like that, knowing that in just under a year, we opened this facility. And, uh, and there were thousands of people who were able to come and experience. And even since then, we've seen hundreds of folks give their life to Jesus and they got to sit where those people made those decisions. That's great. So what has changed and what has not changed since you moved into a permanent location? Well, the things that have changed, uh, there has been a really unique 
culture shift as far as after the services go. Uh, people do tend to hang around a lot longer. The lobby space is remarkable, which is so good for building relationships mm. and connections, of course. And the things that have not changed, though, would be, you know, we have not shifted away from how we view excellence in our services. And it is a powerful experience to be able to have the same church in different locations, whether it is in a high school or if it's in an old Menards building. So you know wherever you go, you're gonna get a great experience with Eagle Brook. So Sam's Club is literally on the other side of this wall, right? That's right. So can they hear when there's a service going on? They cannot hear. I think there's, I think three layers of soundproofing between where we are sitting and, and Sam's Club. Let's check this out. Why don't you play music in here as loud as you can? and I'm gonna just go and stand in there and see if I can hear, okay? Let's try this. Nothing. No, you were right. Couldn't hear a thing. Well, that's it, our final road trip of the year. Thanks, Apple Valley, for having us. Now it's time for today's message. Former senior pastor Bob Merritt is here to bring our last message in the series, Voices. Please welcome Bob Merritt. Thank you for that. Um, man, if you're new here today, you're wondering what's all the fuss, and I get it. I mean, there's, but it's, it's a good fuss. Um, it's great to see you again. All of you, that warms my heart, that kind of welcome. Uh, so undeserved, but I'm very grateful for it. Uh, I can't tell you how much I love our church and love our staff. And all of you who call this place home, and those of you who are newer here, we're glad you're here as well. So glad you're here. Our family of 12, soon to be 13, uh, never miss worshiping God with you on the weekends. We sit right over here on my, off to my right. It's the highlight of our week, really. Our dog, Blue, by the way, is still good. <laughs> He's still hunting pheasants, still, he, uh, still committing... Still committing unspeakable sins throughout the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, a few years after we were married, my wife, Lori, and I were expecting our first child, and we had an old car that her parents had given us, and it was a, a lime green Cutlass Supreme, total junker. <laughs> Burned oil, Transmission slipped, had a gaping hole in the driver's seat that when you sat down, it kind of sucked you in and just buried you alive, basically. I was pastoring a small church in Fallen, Wisconsin, trying to survive on a salary of $11,000 a year, and the only vacation we could really afford was to go out to Pittsburgh to visit her parents where they lived. So one summer afternoon, we left Wisconsin and planned to drive 900 miles through the night. But about 5 p.m. near Eau Claire, our engine overheated, of course. Steam was rolling out from under, under the hood. So I pulled off the ramp, and a feeling of just total despair overwhelmed me. Strange town, no money. We coasted off this exit where all the repair shops were closed for the day. And we limped off the ramp, car was boiling over, and right there on the side of the road was a makeshift sign that said, radiator repair, <laughs> two blocks ahead. And I thought, this has to be God. So we rolled up to this guy's house, and in his garage was a big tub of water, welding tools, and he was working on a radiator. And gang, think of this, what are the odds? of my car overheating at the exact time, at the exact exit, where I see a homemade sign that led us down a street where our car died right in front of a guy's house who just happens to fix radiators. I thought, God's all over this. So I walked up to him. I said, I have a leak in my radiator. Do you think it can fix it? He said, not today. This is my last one. Clearly, he wasn't getting the same message from God that I was getting. So I leaned in. 
I said, but we're on our way to Pittsburgh. Could you do just one more? He said, sorry, this is my last one. A little bit annoyed, he was. I said, what if I can pull the radiator radiator out myself and put it back? Because I'd done that a few times before. Then would you fix it? He paused. He looked at me. I said, my wife is six months pregnant. He looked over in the car, and Laurie gave a little wave and smiled. He said, all right, if you can pull it, I'll try to fix it. I said, fantastic. Can I borrow some tools? He looked at me like, you are pushing it, man. Grabbed his tools, crawled under the car, got fluid all over me, pulled the radiator. The guy fixed it for 20 bucks. We were back on the road in an hour. But I will never forget my feeling of hopelessness laying under that car with fluid dripping on my, I thought, we have no money, no future. I can't even take care of my family. I'm not even sure I want to be a pastor anymore. Gang, I was so uncertain about my life that a year later, I resigned from that church and went back to school for three years to Penn State just to try to find myself, really, honestly. I was 32 years old, two little kids, back in an apartment again, and there was an instability gap in our lives that made us feel very alone and very desperate. Ever felt that way? Maybe for you today, it's a gap in your marriage. And where the intimacy and closeness you once had is is gone, and where you are now is not where you want to be. Or maybe it's a son or daughter who's struggling. They have such promise, but now they're stuck and not thriving. Or you've lost a friend recently. Or maybe your health or lost yet another pregnancy. And the sadness you feel is tangible. And it's daily. Or maybe you don't even know what it is, but there's a gap that longs to be filled because where you are in life is not where you thought you would be presently. Well, there's two things over the years I've learned about gaps in my own life, and the first one is this. Wherever there's a gap, there's a longing for it to be filled. And the second thing I've learned is that God does some of his best work in the gaps that we experience in life. There's a woman in the Bible who had enormous gaps, and she was desperate. Her husband had just died. And so not only did she have a companionship gap, she had an income gap, and was about to lose her home and her two boys to a creditor as payment for her debts. In those days, if you couldn't pay, uh, they would take anything of value. In this case, her two boys, who could serve at least as laborers in the field. This woman's whole world was collapsing, And we pick up the story in 2 Kings 4. Look what it says. Now a wife of one of the prophets. So this is a pastor's wife. Wife of one of the prophets went to Elisha, who's also a pastor, prophet. She went to him for help saying, my husband is dead. And you know that he was a loyal servant of God. But now the creditor is coming to take away my two boys to be his servants. Elisha said, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she answered and said, I have nothing. I have nothing in the house. And isn't that how we feel when we have a gap? I've got nothing. No energy, no answers, no hope. Friends, I can't tell you how often in my life I have felt like I've got nothing left. Even ramping up to this weekend, I dealt with doubts of, I've got no creativity, no talent, not a single new idea. I'm a bald little man. (laughs) I got nothing. That's this woman. And some of you might feel that way about a family matter or personal issue that nobody knows about. Did you notice the first thing that she did? The Bible says she went to Elisha for help. She asked for help. It's the first step to bridging a gap. A few months ago, I got a text from a very close friend of mine, 
just a wonderful Christian man. He's a husband, he's a father of three, a teacher, a coach. Solid as can be. This text came out of the blue. It said this, Bob, I'm really struggling right now and feel like everything in my life is under attack. He said, I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm anxious and angry. I lack joy. I remember how often you said how much counseling helped you. Do you know somebody? I feel like I'm drowning. That single text unleashed a flow of help that's going to save him. And it all began with a single word, help. This widow asked Elisha for help, but then Elisha asked her a very important question. He said, what do you still have in your house? Because when we're desperate, we can get blinded by a fog of hopelessness. But Elisha cuts through the fog and says, I know it's bad. I know it feels hopeless, but what might you still have? What resource? What ability, what friend do you still have that maybe can help fill this gap? She says, look, I've got nothing except a little bit of oil. I've got nothing. But I'm telling you, sometimes that's all God needs. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of oil, a little bit of faith, a little bit of something. Elijah said, go. Ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Get as many as you can. Then go out, go inside, shut the door, and pour the oil into the jar. So she went and did what she was told. Now understand, Elisha's directive makes no sense whatsoever. I've got a little bit of oil. Go get a bunch of jars. We're going to fill them. Are you crazy? Makes no sense whatsoever. It's completely irrational. But the Bible says she went and she did, not knowing the outcome. And maybe some of you are thinking, all right, Bob, come on. Nice Bible story and all. But even if it's true, things like that don't happen today. Here's what I think. I think the same God who filled the oceans with water, teeming with creatures and fish, Whales, dolphins, you name it, sharks, everything. The same God who filled the universe with everything that exists, created you and me, I think, can fill a few jars any day, any time. There's no gap God can't fill. There's no problem he can't solve. He raised the dead. He calmed the storms, he cured the sick, he protected the weak, and he can raise, calm, cure, and protect you no matter what your gap might be today. So she takes her little bit of oil and starts pouring. And she doesn't know how, but the oil keeps flowing. It's like, get the jars, because... God's resources are unlimited, and it just keeps coming. And after every single jar was filled, it says, the oil stopped. She sold the oil, paid her debts. And I got to this point in my preparation this, this past couple of months, and I said to myself, but what about next week's bills? What about next month's bills? The oil stopped at the last jar. She paid her debts, but now the oil's gone. What about next month? Don't miss this. I've been sitting on this for a few weeks. <laughs> Here's the statement. We think it's the oil we need, but it's the oil giver. We think it's the oil. We think it's the money, the job, the person, or provision, but it's not the oil. It's the oil giver that we need. The oil stopped with the last jar. Because God wanted her to know that he can be trusted for the day, not knowing tomorrow. There will always be enough for the day for those who trust him. Gang, it's not the oil. It's the oil giver who, if you trust him fully, will meet you and fill you with whatever is needed for every single day. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 with some bread and a couple of fish? People started following him because they wanted free food. 
Look what he says. He says, look, I know what you're doing. You're following me because you want a free lunch. But do you know, I wish you knew that I am the bread of life, that those who come to me will never be spiritually hungry again. People followed Jesus to be filled with food, but he wanted them to be filled with him. So enjoy the food, but be filled with him. Enjoy your home, sports, kids, travel, whatever, but be filled with him. Be led by him. Be healed and helped by him. And I have a question. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with trusting God to fill you every day with whatever you need? How are you doing with trusting him with every part of your life, even the parts that don't make sense? And asking him to lead you through it. Even though you don't know the next step. You don't know what's tomorrow. Because when you have a gap. It longs to be filled. And we as human beings. Try to fill our gaps with everything under the sun. Except God sometimes. If you have a loneliness gap. How will you try to fill it? Will you try to compromise your values just to have a friend or a girlfriend or boyfriend? Or will you trust God to meet you and help you? If you have a gap in your marriage, how will you fill it? Will you be tempted to go outside your marriage? Or will you ask God to help you rediscover your love for each other? If you lack purpose, how will you find it? I know a young man right now who lacks purpose, and so what he does, he's trying to fill that emptiness with golf, gambling, and drinking, and it's absolutely destroying his family. He's in the process of losing his marriage. Gang, when there's a gap, how will you try to fill it? I want to offer three ways today how you can do this, and the first one is this. you got to go deep and daily with God. God wants to fill you, but you got to go to him. Quick time out. Do you remember during the pandemic when everything was closed? And when a store did open, it's only a few people at a time, fully masked, and everybody was paranoid, hated it. You know, the pandemic forced us into isolation, and it scared some people so much that they double masked <laughs> while driving alone. In their Prius. <laughs> Is that over the line? I don't know. Sorry. We love you, Prius people. I'm retired. I can do that. The human soul was not built for isolation. It was made for interaction and love. And when that's missing, it goes searching. Remember what happened next? We wanted to feel good again, so our souls went searching for a fix. Three quarters of us in our nation, of homeowners, did renovations. Three, a, a, histor a historic record. We wanted to fix something. We're trying to meet a need. Binge buying. I never saw Amazon Prime trucks going up and down our street, just right and left. I, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Binge buying. Alcohol consumption, pornography, all skyrocketed, trying to fill this void. Then in 2021, travel opened up. Restaurants, parks, theaters. Remember there was this mad rush. We, we did our annual boundary water trip, hog hole trip, and uh, my brother-in-law, I said to him, he's in this video, I said, who are all these people? All the campsites were taken because there was this mad rush. He said, maybe it's all your church people <laughs> who finally found your spot. <laughs> oh, God. Can I tell you, though, what helped our family more than anything during the, the close down? We went deep and daily with God. 
who led us by quiet waters, calmed our souls. Gang, when your soul is depleted and damaged, there's nothing you can buy at Walmart that'll fill it. Another round of golf won't heal it. Amazon Prime can't cure an empty and depleted soul. Because it's never the oil that we need, it's the oil giver who leads us beside quiet waters and fills and restores our soul. Fantastic book, Resilient. John Eldridge says that each of us has an innermost being. And God wants to fill that innermost being with his love, joy, and strength. It comes from Ephesians 3 that says, May God strengthen you with power in your innermost being. Did you know this? God wants to strengthen each one of you. He wants to strengthen me with his power in your innermost being. Do you sense God's power in the very depths of your soul that carries you through? Eldridge says our being has three levels, shallows, midlands, and depths. He says the shallows are where many people exist today. They're occupied by text, tweets, TV, and the stock market. Very shallow. I was, a few years ago, I noticed that my whole mood would swing up and down based on my stock market app. I was driving through Montana, surrounded by God's beauty, but my soul was agitated because I was checking my app, and it was in red. I will never forget this moment. I said out loud to myself, this is so stupid. I'm done being driven by a stupid app. I deleted it, and my anxiety dropped. By 80%, I haven't looked back. Stupid stuff. But the shallows are where many of us live. Distractions and trivia dominate our lives. Next level, he says, is the Midlands. This is where deeper concerns can occupy the human heart. You know, it could be concerns about kids, neighbors, aging parents. For a while. These, are, these are legitimate concerns, but Jesus warns us. He says, look, be careful of this. I know you all have concerns, he says. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down by the cares of this life. What weighs on your heart these days? They're legitimate concerns. But Jesus is saying something to us. He's saying, look, you can release all of that every single day and trust me. Not that you don't get involved, but trust me that I'm going to see you through. Further down is our depths, our innermost being, says Eldridge, and it's where God wants to dwell and rule. It's where God can strengthen and fill us with his love, joy, and peace so that no matter what's happening in the shadows or the midlands, you begin to actually know and sense that God is going to carry you through. How do we live more of our days in the depths with God instead of the shadows and midlands? Eldridge says it starts simply by giving God our daily attention and saying to him several times a day, God, I'm here. Fill me. Lead me. Help me. Protect me. He says it helps to have a designated time and place where you sit quietly with everything off. You sit quietly and invite God to speak to you through his word or through a good book. And then he says, practice what I call benevolent detachment, benevolent, benevolent detachment, where you untangle yourself from the 24-7 news cycle and learn to give God the world's problems. Eldridge said it this way, there has to be some time in your day where you just let it all go. The tragedy, heartbreak, latest shooting, earthquake, the soul was never meant to endure all this. It's way too much. You cannot carry the sorrows of the world. Only God can do that. So the first way to bridge these gaps is go deep and daily with God and just try to get in the habit of releasing this stuff, pushing it back, saying, God, carry me through. Second way to bridge these gaps is you got to stay off the roof. <laughs> uh, this past winter, I grabbed a shovel 
got an extension ladder, and uh, without telling anybody, I climbed up on our roof to shovel off the snow. I knew it was a bad idea for a 66-year-old man to get up on his roof to shovel snow, but I figured I'm not your average 66-year-old man, so up I went. The problem was I couldn't get down. The ladder was jammed under the eave, and I couldn't get my foot on the top rung, so I was dangling there backwards. You know the feeling. About 20 feet off the ground, so I scrambled back up on top of the roof, and I stood there, looking around at the neighborhood. <laughs> and I was in a spot, I was where I didn't want to be. My wife was gone. None of the neighbors were home. Thanks, Mike, you should have been home. Uh, so being above average, I decided to jump, that's right. <laughs> And I was hoping for a soft landing, but it wasn't soft. I landed with a crash, and I crumpled up in a heap, and it jarred my back. And later, when I told my wife about this, Lori, she just looked at me. Zero sympathy, no compassion. She simply said, I can't help you. And she walked away because she knows that most of my gaps are self-inflicted. Is that true with you? Gang, how many, of our, how many people today have a career gap because they decided to coast during the pandemic and take a 12-month vacation? Or they have a financial gap because they keep overspending their, their money. Or they have a spiritual gap because they haven't cracked open a Bible or led their family to church in three and a half years. So many young people today feel an intense relational gap. And I get it. But then they meet someone, but then there's the question of how far they should take it. And if the relationship progresses, you know, the logical step for many people today is to start sleeping together because they think that's going to fill this gap for love and belonging. The problem is, God is very clear in his word that sexual intimacy is sacred and reserved for a committed marriage that unites a husband and wife physically and spiritually in Jesus Christ. And that sex outside of marriage well, it can be exciting and fun, usually leads to regret, shame, and a wounding of the soul that never fully heals. And what they thought would fill the gap for intimacy actually causes a deeper gap of regret and loss. You know, how many of our gaps of our own making, because we don't stay off the roof, we don't stay out of the ditch. I love this. It's on my phone. I look at it once in a while to remind myself to stay out of the ditch. You know, some people wonder, why am I always struggling? <laughs> they keep jumping in the same ditch of poor judgment. Bad decisions. Stay off the roof. Stay out of the ditches. Third way to fill these gaps, make one more cast. I love this. Last fall, I got a text from a good friend, Travis Wormadal, who's staff on this church. Staff on this church. Staff in this church. Okay. And he asked me if I wanted to go musky fishing on Lake Vermilion. We'd go with another friend and musky guy, Dave Ledman, and I hesitated because musky guys are strange. <laughs> they are. They'll fish, they'll fish three days without catching a thing. And they'll think it's great. <laughs> because they got to follow. They fish followed their lure. And I'm, I'm like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> but I went, and after, no kidding, after about a thousand casts, Dave said, I got to follow. I didn't see anything. 
Thousand casts more. He said it again. I might have seen some sort of shadow in the water, but Dave and Travis were all excited about this. By day three, I was done. I, I just wanted to go home, and I was so glad. Dave said, okay, one more spot. That'll be it. Went to this final spot, and Dave said, okay, five more casts, which is kind of a thing with him. No kidding. On the final spot, the final cast, this torpedo rises out of the deep, grabs my bait, all chaos erupts in the boat, and this thing begins dragging me all over the bow of the boat, all the way around the boat, back side of the boat. It was going all over the place. I couldn't believe what was happening. We landed this fish. It looks Photoshopped. It's not. I don't even know what that is, okay? Here's the point. Is there a point? I don't know. Here's the point. Some of you, some of you are facing a gap right now, and you've made thousands of casts, thousands of tries, and you're tempted to give up, maybe on your faith or your marriage. Maybe you're tempted to cut a corner, move in with somebody, compromise your values because you're facing some sort of gap that you can't fix. I get it. And I don't know why these gaps happen sometimes, but no matter your situation, I believe God wants to fill your gap. The oil giver wants to fill you with his love and his provision and hope, but maybe, maybe he's waiting for you to make one more cast, one more step of faith, one more prayer, one more plea for help. The Bible says, cast all your cares on him. We can do this because he cares for us. And gang, often it's when you have nothing left that you make one more cast and the oil giver unleashes his power and he fills your life. And then you realize something. You realize that what God produced in you during the gap wouldn't have happened any other way. In that gap, maybe God brought you to faith. Maybe he deepened your wisdom. Maybe he taught you to finally trust him. Maybe he produced a new kind of strength in you that you wouldn't have gotten any other way. I'm telling you, it's during the gaps that God produced things in me. I wouldn't have gotten any other way. So I wonder today, anybody here need to make one more cast? One more prayer. One more promise to God that you will trust him no matter what. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer today. It's this, Jesus, help. And then we're going to close with a song after this prayer. Jesus, help. It's the accurate cry of a desperate heart. Honestly, it's the cry of my heart almost every day. Jesus, help me. I need you. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. I believe the oil giver wants to meet you in this moment and fill those empty spaces that each of us encounter in life. So let me lead you. In this prayer, it might help you to close your eyes. You don't have to. God can deal with that. It might help you to just put your palms in your lap and hold them up as a posture of receiving God's gift and healing today. You don't have to do that, but it might help. It might help to say or whisper these two simple words. Jesus, help. I'm going to lift up a few scenarios to God in prayer. And if a scenario applies to you, just whisper or pray the words, Jesus, help. Psalm 34 says the Lord hears his people when they call to him. So let's do that today. Would you bow with me and pray? Jesus, some of us are facing marriage problems. 
Our marriage isn't where we want it to be. We want it to be safe and joyful, and it's not. Worse, some of us Googled for the first time this week, divorce lawyer, because we're out of answers. So Eagle Brook family, if you need prayer for your marriage, will you make one more cast and breathe these two words? Jesus, help. Lord, some of us are struggling as parents for many different reasons. Maybe it's a prodigal we're hoping comes home or a newborn who won't sleep or a teenager who's struggling or an adult child who's lost and alone. So family, in, in this moment, this applies to you. Will you ask the oil giver to protect your family and do a miracle with your child by praying these two words? Jesus, help. Maybe you're a married Christian couple who longs for a family, but it hasn't happened. You've prayed, pleaded, followed all medical avenues, and it's nothing but heartbreak and loss. The widow had nothing left, nowhere to go. So she took one more step of faith, and God gave her a miracle. And so will you pray these words with her? Jesus, help. God, I'm struggling with addiction. I've sought help. But somehow I get pulled in the same ditch of alcohol, porn, or chemical dependency. It feels hopeless. So if this applies to you, will you make one more prayer, one more cast of faith, and pray this prayer? Jesus, help. I battle anxiety and depression. It's like a cloud that hangs over me most days. I've made a thousand casts. But today I'm making one more, one more prayer to the one whose power is unlimited and overflowing. And so Jesus, help. Finally, God, I'm here today with an empty soul. I've tried to fill it with golf, travel, good food, and the next big adventure. But something's still missing. So God, if you're real, if you love me, if you offer to fill my empty soul with your love, joy, peace, and forgiveness, I make my first cast of faith to you in this moment and say, Jesus, help. Lord, these are the prayers of a desperate heart. We are trusting you, Lord Jesus, the one whose supply is unlimited and the source of all things good to fill us and heal us and do a miracle in us because you, Lord Jesus, are our firm foundation and we will sing this together from our hearts.
pray together one more time. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for being here with us. We thank you that you are the one that we can trust no matter what's going on in our lives. God, we can lean on you in the gaps, no matter what they are. Everybody hearing my voice has a different circumstance, God, and you know each and every one of us so personally. Be there with us in the gaps. Allow us to learn something new about you. Help us to trust you as we go through our week. It's in your name, amen. Hey, thanks for being here today. If you're in need of prayer, the prayer team will be up front. They'd love to pray with you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.